Thank you for being here tonight. Um, thrilled to welcome all of you. And we have a very exciting speaker tonight who's going to tell you everything he didn't learn in school and that you might not be learning in school and that um, about leadership. And so um, I want to say what a great pleasure it is to welcome General John Nicholson back to AUP. I actually made his acquaintance last May when he came to participate in a public policy seminar that was part of our centennial conference, looking back at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 and the way in which it had huge impact on the century that ensued. And so he uh, made a few remarks there, which I thought were very wise and thoughtful, about the impact of war and the importance of reasoned, careful, advanced preparation for the conditions of after war. And that was, uh, when I heard him speak there, I said, gee, I'd really love to have you come and talk to the students at AUP who are engaged in these kinds of issues. And we were lucky because you were coming back through Paris very quickly. He and his wife, Noreen, who uh, he met in Afghanistan, they were both doing work in Afghanistan, um, and who couldn't be here tonight because of her work, because precisely of what she's doing. They have both taken on the responsibility of being on the board of the American University of Afghanistan, which is a sister college of AUP, and uh, you may not remember, but a couple of years ago, now has it been three years ago, had a terrible terrorist attack in which 14 people were killed. The university is now rebuilding, and they are lucky to have you and Noreen uh, on the board helping with that. So we are very honored to be the first stop on a kind of whirlwind tour. Uh, John Nicholson is going to be speaking tomorrow at Sciences Po on the anniversary of um, of September 11th, but also talking, I think, about NATO issues tomorrow. And then there's a whole series of uh, talks at Les Invalides uh, on Friday to discuss coalition warfare. I would like to thank also the uh, faculty of the International and Comparative Politics Department for co-sponsoring this event with the President's Office. So today, General Nicholson is going to speak about leadership under conditions of complexity and risk. And there are actually few people better equipped to shed light on this particular topic. General Nicholson is a very recently retired United States Army four-star general who spent six years in combat during his 36 years of distinguished military service. He last commanded the US forces in Afghanistan and the 41-nation NATO-led Resolute Support Mission. He was the longest serving commander of NATO forces in Afghanistan, where his leadership and his close relationship with Afghan leaders were key to brokering the first ceasefire in the 18-year conflict, um, and I think actually provided the, the conditions of possibility for the peace negotiations, which are ongoing but stalled at this particular moment, and I'm sure you'll have more to say about that. General Nicholson spent much of his service in the joint multinational and interagency area, working closely with the State Department, with intelligence agencies, with law enforcement, national security staff, and numerous non-governmental organizations. He told me tonight he has served seven presidents. Is that right? As such, he is widely lauded and admired as a uniquely skilled, quote, warrior diplomat. And that is the description everybody uses when they describe uh, General John Nicholson. A graduate of West Point and Georgetown University, he teaches leadership at Harvard and at the U.S. National Defense University, specializing in adaptive leadership in situations of high complexity and risk. He's also president of the PenFed Foundation, whose mission it is to provide service members and veterans, their families, and support networks the skills and resources they need to build a strong future. In this room, General Nicholson are students of international relations, American foreign policy, security studies, development studies. Um, there are students who are going to participate in the war games at the Ecole de Guerre a little bit later, and there are students who are veterans of those war games as well. And there are also students in this room who simply are interested in what you have to say about leadership and in the stories you're going to tell us about your own learning in those fields. So we're very honored to host you here at AUP. Thank you for being with us. So Notes here. Don't want to. Um, thank you so much for that generous introduction, and uh, it's wonderful to be here with you all tonight. As uh, as uh, President Shank said, uh, when I learned more about AUP during a visit last uh, May, uh, we really was hoping to have an opportunity to come back. We have to move it up. Oh, okay. You're so much Great. taller than I. There we go. Okay. Is that good? <coughs> Thanks. Can you 
guys still see me there? Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, and again, I wanted to thank the uh, professors uh, for um, your presence here today, and I really am looking forward to the dialogue with you uh, going forward. And main, mainly, uh, I want to address the students, and uh, so I'm uh, really uh, grateful for the opportunity to chat with you, and I understand we have undergraduates here and graduates, but first I want to say congratulations to all of you, you know, for taking the positive steps for your own intellectual growth and being here at AUP, because this is extremely important. I mean, intellectual growth is, uh, of course, an important objective in and of itself uh, in general, but also for those of you who will end up in the national security sector or international security or international organizations, I think your ability to learn and grow and adapt is actually essential to the challenges you're going to face in the world. And I've dealt with some complex things, but I think that what you're going to deal with in the future is going to be even more complex than what we've been dealing with the last few decades. And so to illustrate what I mean by that, I wanted to share, as uh, President Shank said, some of my own story uh, of, of being a practitioner and a student throughout my own career. What, what I learned, what I didn't uh, learn, what I had to learn on the job, what I learned at school, because I think it's illustrative of how you might approach your own studies and your own development as a student's going forward to prepare for whatever career that you have in mind. So from, from my perspective, as you heard, it's 36 years in the military service, and that was interspersed with periods of education. So, you know, undergraduate education, then about 10 years of service at the tactical level, followed by uh, a graduate, uh, program of study, then another nine years of uh, as a practitioner, and then another graduate experience, and then about 14 years at the very senior level of dealing with uh, the situation largely in Afghanistan. So I wanted to kind of walk you through that as a sort of a case study of, uh, of what I learned along the way, and then what what I needed to what I needed to educate myself on. Um, you know, my first 10 years in the Army. We're in the Cold War, so I'm sure you all are studying the Cold War and what, what it's about. But uh, in those days, you know, I was commissioned in 1982 out of West Point as an infantry officer. So infantry officers and the military are the ones that close with the enemy. Our mission was close with and destroy the enemy. I mean, this, this is our mission as infantry officers. And uh, uh, this, um, the units in those days, and I served in light infantry, it's the 82nd Airborne Division, the 75th Ranger Regiment, the 10th Mountain Division. These units were very focused on fighting the Soviet Union. They were the enemy. And so this, um, the Soviet Union and their proxies and their allies in the Warsaw Pact were dedicated to our defeat. And our role was to protect my country, America, but also our alliance and our way of life. And so for those of us in, as junior officers and soldiers in those days, it was very much an existential struggle. And we were very focused on being the best we possibly could be. And we, and we were pretty good. Uh, we knew everything there was to know about the enemy, how many troops they had, where they were, what equipment they had, who their leaders were, you know, analysis of their leaders, as, as best as we could tell what their plans were. And then we trained against this very specific set of conditions then. So, so we had a lot of information, and then we trained against that information. To a, to a high degree of competence to be able to defeat their approach and defeat their forces. We had, uh, um, a, there, there was a premium placed on tactical excellence, you know, kind of down and in, your ability to do your job at the tactical level. You know, in the 82nd Airborne, it was, we can jump, fight, and win. You know, it was very simple. That, that's what our job is. And the Ranger Regiment, uh, we, we lived by a creed called the Ranger Creed and included things like, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. I will never accept defeat. I will drive on and complete the mission, though I be the lone survivor. So this is the army that we built in the 80s during the Cold War. And it was big. And, and when I, I'm using army in the universal sense. I'm talking about our whole armed forces. Uh, the army alone, we had a million people, 400,000 in Europe alone. And we could reinforce that, that force with another 10 divisions in 10 days. So, so logistics and tactics were the focus of that army. So the, uh, as we, um, in, in 1989, uh, the Berlin Wall came down. And, and as you know, by December of 91, the Soviet Union dissolved. And so we had this instrument 
this military instrument that had been built to defeat this one foe, and now the conditions, you know, the ground shifted under our feet. And then we went into a period of desert storm, you know, when Saddam Hussein invaded, invaded Kuwait, uh, when this army, this, this armed force trained to fight the Soviets, was moved over to the Middle East and did very well against Saddam. And so in a hundred hour war, they defeated uh, Saddam's army, which was kind of modeled on a Soviet-style army. So in the minds of many of the practitioners, this kind of cemented the wisdom of what we were doing. And so you can imagine, well, you know, you're successful in the Cold War, you win uh, on a tactical battlefield using this old methodology, and it's tough to change. So, so because people thought it was reinforced the wisdom of what we were doing. So we entered a period in the 90s um, where we had to deal with change. So it, it, right at that moment, uh, as, as a young officer, I left the Ranger Regiment and went to, to my first master's program. And it was an excellent school called the School for Advanced Military Studies at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I got a master's in what's called operational art. But the educational experience in the military in those days, even though it was uh, exceptional, was very focused on the tactical level of war. And so you were rewarded for a mastery of tactics, of your ability to defeat an opponent on the battlefield. Um, we also studied theorists, and I think that the study of theorists is, is very important. I'll come back to that later. We, we looked at, uh, you know, Clausewitz, Sun Tzu, Machiavelli, Yomini, Dupic, Duhay, Mahan, Galula, and others. So the, so the study of theorists was the closest thing to enabling us to look forward uh, that, that we got. Um, but again, uh, um, the, the, it was more of a synthesis of what we learned than preparing for the way forward, and, and I'll come back to this later. So in the 90s then, this armed force had to deal with new challenges. So the Cold War was over, the Soviet Union was gone, we had a period of time where we hoped, you know, that, uh, that Russia would become a friend. You know, that proved, proved wrong subsequently, but, um, but we dealt with new challenges and, and more complex problems. So one of the challenges was, well, how small do we make the army? If we don't have this enemy of the Soviets, what, what do we do? Do we, you know, uh, and where, where do these forces go? So this was a complex new challenge, and frankly, we kind of stuttered through that. We didn't, we didn't quite get it right. Uh, we, had, we had complexity and risk in new places, places like Mogadishu, and Liberia, Rwanda, and then Bosnia. And now, one of the things about Bosnia uh, and the complexity there was we approached all these problems from a coalition perspective. And th this is one of the important things we learned in these days, was for the legitimacy of what we were doing, and we're not fighting an existential war against the Soviets. We're dealing with a complex problem with opinions on all sides. Approaching it at, as, from a coalition perspective was critically important to our legitimacy. And typically these coalitions were built around NATO, not always, but NATO quite often was, was the nucleus for the coalition. And uh, we debated how to deal with this new complexity. So the leader of our armed forces during Desert Storm was a gentleman named Colin Powell. I'm sure you've all heard of him. So General Powell was our chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He went on to be Secretary of State under President Bush. General Powell had a thing called the Powell Doctrine. The Powell Doctrine said you only use military when you can apply overwhelming force against an attainable objective. Otherwise, don't use the military instrument. And this was the idea of a desert storm-like fight is the only time you use the military. And he was responding to things like, you know, Black Hawk Down, uh, you know, in Mogadishu where you apply a a small force with vague rules of engagement, they get into trouble and we lose, we lose people. So it, uh, on the other hand, we had Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. And, and her, she famously said, what's the use of having a large army if you never use it? She got a point there. Uh, and you know, we're, we're spending enormous amounts of money on this military, so let's use it. Uh, we didn't resolve that, that thing. It went back and forth. One, one, of the other, one of the other issues we had to deal with is what are your rules of engagement in these types of scenarios? And this is extremely important. We really didn't have to worry about that under the so when we were facing the Soviets. We, it was going to be a, uh, a slugfest. And, and candidly, um, we, we, did not, we were not concerned about when and how we apply lethal force. But in this new, more complex world, the rules of engagement and how you apply lethal force were essential to maintaining your legitimacy and accomplishing your goal. It's the old uh, uh, phrase you may have heard from the Vietnam War, in order to save the village we had to destroy it. You know, this was a famous phrase that came out of the Tet Offensive, which of course is ridiculous. 
And so how do we then change our culture in the military so that we can apply lethal force but do it precisely, discriminately, proportionately in a way that accomplishes the mission without undermining our own legitimacy? So these are some of the complexities we were dealing with. Well, then 9-11 happened. So on 9-11, uh, I was working in the Pentagon as a, uh, as a lieutenant colonel, and my office uh, was within 100 feet of where the, where the plane uh, came through the building. And so, thank God, I was at home moving into our house. We happened to have our, our move that day, so I wasn't in my office. Um, but my office was, was incinerated. One of my colleagues who was in the office, you know, had third degree burns, but everyone from his desk down was killed. And so this was a game changer for us, obviously. We were, those of us in the military at that time, you know, we, we had had this existential threat, this sense of purpose in the Cold War. We dealt with all this complexity in the 90s, and then 9-11 happened. And that galvanized things for many of us once again. And it certainly did for me. And so as a soldier and as an American, I felt this can never happen to our country again. And so for many of us, this became our sense of purpose. So it was, it gave us a renewed sense of purpose, but at the same time, it was an incredibly complex set of conditions that, that we faced uh, after 9-11. So uh, it was about that time then, I went back to grad school. And uh, for a second master's degree, what we call the National Defense University. So in the military, you do you do about 10 years as a junior officer. You, you go to a thing called staff college at the grade of major. You know, you're probably in your mid-30s. Uh, then you, then you, you get a master's degree. At that point, you go away, you do more operational experience, and you come back at what's called the senior service college uh, when you're a colonel. And this is, this is the last formal uh, educational experience that everyone gets before they compete to become a general. So, so, so we're now, I'm now at a school called the National Defense University and the National War College. So we call them the National War College, and this is based on Theodore Roosevelt and his adage, you know, to be, to be, uh, if you want to be at peace, then prepare for war. And so that's that's what we call it, the National War College. So in the National War College, again, um, looking at that education, how it preparing it was an excellent education. But, but I'd have to say it was more synthesis of what we'd experienced and not necessarily preparing us for the way forward. And so, and, and I'll come to that in a second, uh, about what are the things I learned subsequent to, uh, to National uh, Defense University. But one of, the, one of the things that was apparent, though, as we went into the, into the post-9-11 world, was this importance of coalitions. And so you'll remember that uh, after 9-11, the... Uh, NATO, the Atlantic Treaty, which forms the basis of NATO, has a provision called Article 5. Article 5 of the Atlantic Treaty is a, is a provision for collective self-defense. And what it says is, for any NATO member, if one member is attacked, all are attacked. And all will respond. Now, it does require political decision, uh, where all the members have together and say, yes, we're going to invoke <laughs> Article 5. Article 5 had never been invoked. Uh, and after 9-11, it was invoked. And it was always imagined that Article 5 would be invoked to bring America into a European war. But in this case, Article 5 was invoked by our European allies, and they all came to our defense. And so this was uh, uh, a very important moment for NATO, and a very important moment for all Americans to realize when we were attacked, all of our allies stood by our side, and they all went to Af Afghanistan. And even to this day, when I was commander, we had 41 nations in our coalition in Afghanistan. At one point it was up to 50, but even to today it's still at 41. And I mention that because, again, back to this concept of legitimacy. If you're going to use military force, it has got to be legitimate. It has got to be done in accordance with your values, in accordance with international law. There's got to be a legal foundation, and it must be legitimate. So extremely important. So let me... Uh, I graduated from National War College, and then, as, uh, as uh, President Schenck said, I went, I went off and spent uh, really six of the next uh, 12 years in, in Afghanistan. And so that was uh, for, as a brigade commander, as a one-star, a two-star, and then back as a four-star. So uh, many lessons to share from this, more, more than, we, than, than I have time to discuss in my remarks, but I do want to touch upon some of them that, that I think are extremely important and relevant for you all as students especially those who are students of national security and international security. Um, in, 
in complexity, one, uh, the, 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 more, uh, the more complex the environment you're dealing with, the more actors are going to be involved. Indeed, this is one of the elements of complexity that you've got to deal with. So one of the challenges I found as a leader that was not really addressed in my education was how to achieve unity of effort amongst all these actors over whom you have no authority. As I mentioned before, Cold War Army, you could rise from second lieutenant to four-star general and only deal with other people in the Army. Occasionally you deal with somebody from another service, maybe the Air Force or the Marines, but you, you could spend your whole career never having to deal with anyone outside of your culture. But in this world post 9-11, you're dealing with mainly people from outside your culture. And you have no authority. You can't tell them what to do. You hope to gain their cooperation. You hope to achieve unity of effort. How do you do that? It's not taught in military schools, but it's something you have to learn on the job. So it, it's beyond just a, a nice to do. It, it's absolutely essential to your success. I'd argue that without achieving unity of effort in these complex environments, you will not be successful. And we can talk about specific examples later in the Q&A. Uh, the, the, the risk that, that uh, I found many military leaders, a trap really you fall into, is to sort of stay in your comfort zone. Hey, you're very comfortable with the military aspects of war. You know that inside and out. Uh, it's difficult to deal with the folks in the human rights community or the folks from the EU and the donor community or, or, the, or the Afghans, perhaps, the political opposition to the government you're working with. So you just don't do it. So you stay over here in your military space, in your comfort zone, looking down and in. Of course, that's exactly the, the wrong thing to do. You, you have got to establish those uh, bridges and connections with those other folks. So I, I'd argue that if you're in a, you know, if, like me, if you're working for your government, you're not going to deliver for your own government. You're not going to deliver for your alliance. You're not going to deliver for the organization you're working for if you stay in your comfort zone. You've got to get out of it. You've got to learn something new if you're going to effectively uh, integrate all these instruments of power. So, so how do you do this? So, for example, in Afghanistan, I had, I had, Normally in the military you have one chain of command, you've got one boss and they have a boss and it's very clear cut, the hierarchy, the culture is all built around that. In Afghanistan you essentially had three chains of command. So a U.S. chain of command with a, uh, the, cent, the U.S. Central CENTCOM commander, Joe Lotel at the time, that went to the Secretary of Defense and then that went to the President. But during my time in Afghanistan I had two Presidents and they each had different policies. So even though, even in the U.S. chain of command, there's a degree of complexity as personalities change, as policies change, as you're asked to influence those policies. But in addition to that, we had a NATO chain of command. So in, in NATO, uh, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is trying to achieve unity of effort with all the allies and the broader coalition. And so we're dealing with different national cultures, different military cultures. Each nation has their own political evolutions they're going through. They're having elections. Uh, they're having other crises at home, all of which affect you on the uh, battlefield. You'll remember the uh, uh, attempted coup that occurred in Turkey in 2016. We had Turkish troops in Afghanistan and three Turkish generals. And then an attempted coup occurs back, back in the country. Turkey never, uh, never wavered in their commitment to Afghanistan. So the connection with the Turkish chief of the general staff and the Turkish generals, once they had dealt with the immediate effects of the coup, they, they immediately reaffirmed their commitment to the mission in Afghanistan. And that was mainly about personal relationships. And I'll come back to, to relationships in a minute. So if I were to offer a, uh, a formula for how to deal uh, with unity of effort, th this is what I've kind of learned on, on the job. Um, one is to sort of identify the actors with whom you must collaborate. And so as you move into these situations, look, look at the landscape. Who are the people upon whom our success depends. So, so first of all, just figuring out you need, you need to have a relationship. And then establish that relationship and own that relationship. That means you got to invest time in it. Extremely important. When, when, you, when you sit down together, and again, you're from different organizations, you have no authority over one another, identify what it is, what are the goals that you share. And if you can identify common goals, now you've identified an area that you can immediately work on to achieve unity of effort. So something you can work on together that's mutually beneficial. Equally important is to identify where you know you're going to have friction. So we know we're going to compete over this issue or we're going to potentially 
uh, be on opposite sides on the issue, how are we going to mitigate that friction? And so uh, then you practice that, and, and then when, and you work together in accordance with what you agreed, and over time you build trust. And once you have trust, well then you can start to achieve results. And so this is the formula that I've developed. But relationships are the key to making this happen. Um, the, uh, for the military, what it means is civil-military relations. And so this, again, we have our own culture. We're very comfortable in our culture. It's very important for military folks to get outside of the military culture and establish those relationships with folks that are from a different culture. You've got to invest your personal time to make these relationships work. You've got to devote energy to it. You've got to devote thought to it. And you, what you want to establish is not a transactional relationship, but an authentic relationship. Um, my observation, Americans in particular, and I realize this is not a purely American audience here, Americans tend to be very transactional. And so for the Americans in a room, this just doesn't work in other cultures. I've spent close to eight <coughs> of the last 12 years living in Muslim countries, living in Afghanistan and Turkey. And I would tell you, you know, if you approach relationships in this part of the world, which has a, has a different culture, a different religious tradition, if you approach it in a transactional manner, you just won't be successful. You will not get through. So uh, this um, establishment of relationships, creating a foundation trust, and using the trust to go ahead and get results is really, really critical. The, uh, okay, this, this um, means uh, there's a need for different qualities and typically uh, are emphasized in military uh, training. So in, if you were to Google military values, you know, on, on your computer, you'd see a list of important values like courage, uh, integrity, loyalty, selfless service, dedication. These are all extremely important. What you would not see on that list, however, are things like humility, patience, empathy, emotional intelligence. These are the qualities that are essential to establishing relationships. Again, not taught in our schools, but learned out there in the field as you try to establish these relationships. So, humility and patience, and ability to listen and learn. And when I, when I say humility, uh, I mean uh, intellectual humility. So the idea that you're going to engage someone from, a, from another sector, say someone, you're a military person, you're engaging someone in the human rights world. They know more about human rights. They've forgotten more about human rights than you know right now. Okay, so you need to learn from them. And likewise, ideally, they, they recognize the need to learn from you. Patience, this takes time. It takes time. If they don't initially trust you, if they view you as some sort of adversary or you're the problem, that, then it's going to take time and you just got to have the patience to work through it. So humility and patience enable you to listen and learn. Leaders must have emotional intelligence and empathy, again, if they're going to establish this relationship. So there, there's books written about emotional intelligence. Uh, I, I recommend them. I commend them to you if, uh, if you're interested in this. But emotional intelligence involves a couple of things. One is self-awareness. What, what are your, what <coughs> qualities do you have that might be a block to establishment of relationships? You know, do you have a quick temper? Are you impatient? Uh, are you willing to take the time to listen and learn to others? And then what's your regulatory mechanism? Can you control those impulses so that you can actually establish a relationship? So there's a, there's a self-awareness component to emotional intelligence. The other part is empathy. So empathy is being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. So if I'm sitting down with an Afghan governor in a, in a province that's been racked by war for 40 years, uh, and, I, and I'm the latest American with another good idea about how we're going to solve his problem in the next nine months. You know, you, you got to understand that this person's been dealing with this for decades. So, so you have to be, you know, stop, you know, t take a breath, listen to them, empathize with their situation, and understand so that you can create hopefully a win-win, you know, where you're going to accomplish your objective, <coughs> and you're going to understand their needs and therefore help to accomplish their objective. So empathy is extremely important. And then all of this takes time. So setting aside the time to think and to learn. I mentioned the transition between presidents. When we transitioned from President Obama to President Trump, there was a complete review of the policy. So as, as commander, it was my duty to provide my personal input to the chain of command on what the new policy should be. 
And so that takes time. And there's really no one else in the organization that can do that. that that's something that I needed to do. So, so figuring out how you create the time for yourself to be able to do those things that you need to do. So uh, time management. So I want to mention this because it's relevant to you as students as well as uh, future professionals. This was the biggest challenge I faced as a leader going on, is how to manage my time. And so part of this um, gets to self-awareness. So as an infantry officer for 25 years, we used to say, you know, you're being paid for your back sometimes more than your brain. And uh, nothing against infantry officers, we're all great guys. But the, uh, uh, to deal with complexity, you have to be performing at peak mental performance. Okay, so your brain has to be operating at its peak performance uh, in order to work your way through this complexity. Um, that means uh, sleep, uh, exercise, and fuel in the machine. And so what is your formula going to be for how you're going to do that? Self-awareness. When I, when I was deployed for over six years, I, I didn't get it right on my first deployment. And I was a crispy critter at the end of that uh, deployment. And so going into the next deployment, I said, how much sleep do I need for my brain to be functioning at the right level? What I need is about seven hours of sleep a night. And so I knew guys that said, hey, I can get by on three hours of sleep or four hours of sleep. But, but uh, scientifically, physiologically, the, the effect of a lack of sleep is the same as being inebriated. It's the same as being drunk. So if you, if you are sleepy, you are not performing at your peak. So setting aside seven hours a day when you're going to get your rest is critical. Now, sometimes you won't make it. You know, things are happening. Crises are occurring that, you know, that don't respect your sleep cycle. But, but whenever you can get on that sleep cycle, you need to be on it. The next thing was uh, eating right. So uh, three meals a day is what I ate. Three, you know, decent meals a day. And uh, for me, was necessary to kind of keep me performing at, at a good level. And then... Two hours a day, I would set aside one hour for physical training to work out, and then the other hour to, to get connected with my family. And so on my last deployment, I was deployed for two and a half years. Uh, my wife and I talked every day for at least 20 minutes. And for me, that was essential, to be grounded, to talk to her, uh, <coughs> Uh, stay connected with her, you know, then I would, it would call my kids and parents le less frequently, but my wife it was every single day. And she was very understanding. She kind of monitored, hey, I'm going to tell them about this, but not about that. Uh, so she was very good about that too. But for me, this was extremely important to, to, to have emotional balance. So you have physical balance, emotional balance. For some people in combat, uh, the spiritual dimension is really important too. And if that's a part of your thing, I know... Uh, in, my, in my case, um, in combat situations, when you've done everything you can do to affect the outcome, the, the other thing you can do is pray. And so I, I did that multiple times in combat situations. Uh, but whatever it is for you, whatever that combination is of, of physiological sleep, eating, exercise, emotional connection, spiritual, you have to figure out what that is for you and do it. And in my case, that was about 10 hours a day. Seven hours of sleep, three meals a day, two hours for PT, and staying connected <coughs> with my family. That left me 14 hours a day to do my job. And what I tried to do in that time was do only those things that only I could do for the organization. If somebody else could do it for the organization, then I made sure they were trained to do it and then empowered them to do it. And then that enabled me to do the things that only I could do. You know, only I could think about a new policy. Only I could go meet with President Ghani. Only I could talk to the Secretary of Defense as the commander in Afghanistan. Only I could write a report to the Secretary General of NATO as the commander. So when, when I found those 14 hours were filled with those things, and then my tremendous team that we put together, uh, you know, the, 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 the responsibility there was to, was to select them, make sure they were trained to do their jobs, uh, inspire them, and then let them do their jobs. And, and that was uh, how we got it done. So. Um, if you remember nothing else uh, I say here today, seven hours of sleep. You guys all need to get enough sleep. Um, so let me uh, kind of summarize, and we'll get into some questions and answers. So, you know, the tit uh, one of the uh, one of the titles I, as I was thinking about this was kind of war, leadership, and you, you being the students. And so, war uh, is an extension of politics. You all you all know that from Clausewitz, uh, and politics means policy. So those of you involved in national and international security, 
subjects. This is extremely important. And then you as students understanding how policy is made, the things that affect policy is extremely important. That inherently is what war is all about. It's applying the, the military instrument is one of the instruments we apply to achieve our policy. Uh, but fundamentally it's about achieving political objectives. This involves all instruments of power and then you've got to figure out how to integrate the instruments of power. How do you get unity of effort amongst all the instruments of power? Not only within your own government, but with all the other actors out there, the alliance, the coalition. You know, the EU for Afghanistan leads the donor effort, so unity of effort with the EU. The human rights community, the United Nations, etc. War must be conducted ethically and responsibly and in accordance with international law. And I'm, I'm telling you that as a soldier. So as an American soldier, maintaining the legitimacy of our nation in, in war is extremely important to those of us in uniform. So you fight in accordance with American values. What does that mean? Uh, you adhere to the law, and if you don't, if someone doesn't, then there's accountability. Then you investigate, you, you have a, a process for accountability, and then you deal with the consequences of that. But this is extremely important to maintaining our legitimacy as we go, uh, as you go into, into the conduct of war. Because legitimacy is something that money can't buy. You know, the United States spends uh, over $700 billion on its military. And we can do things unilaterally. But we're always going to be better off, in my belief, if we do things as part of a coalition or part of an alliance. And so the, uh, that gives you the legitimacy to do what you need to do and, and to, uh, and, and again, uh, sustain who we are as America in the world. And I know that you know th this is a uh, um, extremely important topic. I know some of you are studying um, human rights and different aspects, and they're happy to talk about any of that. But all this comes down to leadership in both the political, the military, and with all in the interagency sphere. And I share with you my my um, thoughts on how you achieve unity, unity of effort. So um, I uh, to, to to wrap this up in terms of the remarks. Um, some of you are going to move into the national and international security space. As I said up front, I think the challenges you're going to face are going to be enormously complex, more complex than, than what we've faced, and it's been a pretty complex couple of decades. Um, these, the theorists will help you to help frame these problems intellectually. Uh, you're, you're going to learn a lot from, uh, from your fellow students. I would also encourage you to learn from the practitioners who are out there who are dealing with these issues right now as you go forward. And all of that needs to be a part of the total package as you prepare yourself for whatever you're going to do next. Okay, so thanks very much for uh, letting me share that with you. I look forward to uh, questions and dialogue.